Oh, it is 5.30. All right, I call to order the, well, it's not really a meeting meeting, it's a budget orientation meeting. Is this being just audio or it's video also? We have video and audio going for this tonight. Okay, do you want us to call roll for that? That would be great. We can just go around the room <coughs> and introduce ourselves real quick. Why don't we start here? Mindy Garlington. Budget uh, committee. Budget committee. And my name is Steve Bergeron. I, uh, my name is Steve Bergeron, and I believe, uh, I don't know what I'm really here, I'm, I'm the budget committee person. Perfect. Then Denise, City Council. Tom Mercer of City Council. Randy Ripley, City Council. Matt Tracy, City Council. John Wolven, Budget Committee. Neil Reisner, City Council. Kathy Broker, City of Gladstone. Jackie Batt, City Administrator. Sammy Stemple, Mayor. Ashley Driscoll, City Attorney's Office. Well, thanks all for coming tonight, and just to be clear, we are not presenting the budget tonight. We're just here to have an informal conversation about what your role is on the budget committee, and there's actually two items here that we'd like to spend some time with you, so please feel free to ask any questions and also you're able to take the PowerPoint presentation home in regards to what is your role as a budget committee member. The first that we'd like to do is just a brief um, Orient Ethics overview and that's going to be handled by our city attorney Ashley. Thank you. Would it make more sense if I came up yep. around? Sure. Okay. All right, I'm Ashley Driscoll with the city attorney's office. I recognize most of you. Uh, so, nice to see you again. It was a beautiful afternoon to be at a budget committee meeting. It's supposed to be raining. Um, oh so, I'm going to go. <laughs> I have a really quick agenda tonight. I'm just going to do a refresher on conflicts of interest to public officials, abuse of office, penalties, and what to do if you have questions. I know members of the city council, this is pretty familiar. Um, just bear with me. We do have a new wrinkle to discuss. So, I'm sure that will be very interesting to everybody. Um, so first, what is a conflict of interest? Con conflicts of interest in this context are not the colloquial conflicts, you know, this involves my neighbor, I don't really want to get involved. For Oregon ethics law, it is very focused on whether or not in making the decision or recommendation, you would or could have a financial impact. So this, uh, what the law says, the conflict of interest arises when a decision or recommendation you're making would or could result in a private pecuniary benefit or detriment to you, your relative, or a business for which you or your relative are associated. Conflicts come in two forms, actual and potential conflicts of interest. So again, just to really drive home, drive home this point, a conflict of interest arises when you're making a decision or recommendation will either benefit you financially or allow you to avoid a financial detriment and by you, I mean you as the public official, a relative, which we're going to talk about, or a member of your household. This, uh, not counting obvious things about you know, raising taxes, affecting our personal taxes, that kind of thing. Um, that's a really good question. We'll get to that. That's one of an exception we call a class exception. So we'll get to that. Um, the difference between an actual and a potential conflict of interest, an actual conflict of interest is by voting or making a decision or recommendation, you definitely would have a financial impact. So there's certainty that making that vote, making that recommendation definitely impacts you or a relative or your business financially. A potential conflict of interest is when there's less certainty that you know such a vote or such a recommendation could potentially impact you financially. That is a potential conflict of interest and we're going to get to it, but the distinction is important in how you treat them. So who does conflict of interest apply to? It applies to the public official and a member of your household, which is defined as your spouse or domestic partner, your parent, child, sibling, and their spouses, any of the above of your spouse or domestic partner, anyone for which the public official has legal support, and anyone who provides or receives employment benefits to and from the public official. Essentially, anybody who could potentially benefit from you avoiding a, uh, avoiding a financial detriment or you getting a financial benefit. 
I put the definition of a business for which you're associated up here. I'm not going to spend too much time, but essentially a business that you know you take a salary from, or you um, a publicly held company which you own over $100,000 worth of stock. If you're you know the director of an officer in a publicly held company, or you have to declare it on a statement of economic interest, it's going to be considered a business for which you are associated. And just to be really clear that also extends to your relatives. It's a business that you are associated with or your relatives are associated with. Okay, so what do you do if you have a conflict? For an actual conflict, you publicly announce the conflict and then you refrain from participation in any official action on the issue, including any discussion of the matter. This one comes up pretty often. Let's say that you know that you're going to vote on something or you know you're going to make a recommendation on something and so you participate in all the meetings leading up to the vote. Well, if you have an actual conflict of interest, you need to step away from the discussion in its entirety, not just the vote. So that one has come up quite a few times. For a potential conflict of interest, all you have to do is publicly announce the potential conflict every time it arises. Generally, you know, say that I have this potential conflict of interest. I still believe that I can be impartial on the matter. And then after you've made that disclosure, you can, uh, you can, you can take any official action, including discussions and votes. So one of the things I like to say when I make these presentations is that you should not be afraid of conflicts of interest, especially in a town like Gladstone. You live, you work here, your families, they live and they work here. Conflicts are going to arise. The important thing to do is know how to identify when a conflict is coming up and know how to treat them. So if it's an actual conflict, you declare it, you step away from the issue. If it's a potential conflict, you declare it, and then you can go ahead and participate. Um, like usual, I have a couple examples. Um, so I was thinking of some <coughs> that could pertain exactly to the budget committee. So how about this one? So if you're allocating funds to a building project where your husband works for the engineering firm that is contracted on that building project, is that an actual or potential conflict of interest? Actual. It's an actual conflict of interest because it's your husband, so that is a relative. It's a business for which associated with. He's an employee, and they already have a contract with the city, so they are already financially benefited. So how about allocating funds for a position that you know your son is going to apply for? So again, you're making decisions about budgetary, your son that is both probably a member of, well, I guess um, if they're applying for positions, hopefully they are no longer in your household, but they could potentially be a member of your household and your son. It's a potential because you're allocating funds for the position, but it's not guaranteed because he hasn't applied for it and he hasn't gotten it yet. So the wrinkle that has just come down um, regarding the budget committee and actual and potential conflicts of interest is that the budget committee, I'm sorry, the Oregon Government Ethics Commission recently issued a opinion letter. Now opinion letters are non-binding, they're just supposed to provide general advice. And what this Oregon Government Ethics Committee Commission opinion letter said is that budget committee recommendations are always going to be potential conflicts of interest because your recommendations then have to go up to the city council, the city council has to make their final vote, and so it's always going to be a potential conflict and not an actual conflict. I will tell you that everybody in my office disagrees uh, with this opinion, um, and again because it's non-binding, if this issue d ever did come before the Oregon Government Ethics Commi Commission, they could decide differently. It was just an opinion letter by a staff person, but I thought I'd bring it up. It was issued last month. My recommendation would be always to take the safe course, that you know, if you believe you have an actual conflict of interest, treat it like an actual conflict of interest. I don't think anybody likes to be the test case, uh, but I thought I would bring it up. So are there exceptions? We had, um, we had one of these exceptions already brought up. Uh, first of all, is nonprofits. The definition of a business does not include nonprofits where the associated public official receives no um, compensation from that. And then second is a 
class exception. So the class exception is that if everybody on the city council or in the government body is going to be impacted um, financially the exact same way, for instance, raising taxes, doing a bond levy, utility bills, in those occasions, because everybody's going to have the exact same conflict and business still needs to go on, there is a class exception and you can still vote because everybody has the same actual. I'm not going to get too far into the weeds in it tonight, but um, that is a very clear example of the class exception, raising utilities, raising taxes. The smaller the class gets, for instance, you know, one neighborhood is affected by a rezoning uh, or a decision that's otherwise coming before you, the fuzzier the line gets about whether the class exception applies. So when those, um, when those issues come up, seek legal advice prior to relying on that exception. And then this one has more to do with the next topic, but um, I put it here. There are exceptions. Gifts received under $50 uh, do not count towards conflicts of interest or our next talk topic, which is abuse of office. So conflicts of interest and abuse of office in some cases are overlapping. A public official may not use or attempt to use their position to obtain financial gain or avoid a financial detriment that they would not otherwise be available <coughs> but for the holding of the official position. Are you gaining something of financial value because of your role in the buddy Budget Commission? Are you gaining something of financial value because of your role as a city council? If you are, that would be <coughs> an abuse of office. The same thing if you're avoiding a financial detriment. Um, this applies to both a public official and relatives of the public official using the same definition that we already talked about. And of course we have um, the same examples that I use because I think that they are good ones. Um, so a library committee member using his role on the library committee to lobby the city to award a library janitorial, janitorial contract to his sister. Again, his sister is a member of his or relative under the law and he is using his position to try to gain a financial benefit for his sister. So that would be a violation of the abuse of office. Um, and then this one's actually my favorite because it does come up more than you would think. Um, a member of a Parks and Recreational Board received a free VIP pass to the local softball tournament, which is valued at $200, um, from a company organizing the event. And again, I add this one in because it, it makes a lot of sense when you first hear about it. You're like, well, you know, if we're the Parks and Rec Com Commission Board, we should be able to go to these events and they're going to want to like show us a good time and um, really experience it. Um, and it's just thanking the local officials for the work that they've done. Well, you wouldn't get that free VIP pass if it wasn't for your position as a committee member. And so that would be a abuse of office. So the penalties, um, the penalties are relatively rare. It is a civil penalty of up to $5,000, removal from office, and if the public official has benefited from the violation, he or she may re be required to forfeit twice the amount of the prof profit, and in rare cases, and I actually can't find any, a criminal, um, criminal sanction can be, uh, can be imposed. It's important to realize that penalties are personal and they're not um, against the city, so any decisions that you make as public officials regarding conflicts are personal. And because of that, if you have questions about conflicts of interest, those questions are best directed to the Oregon Government Ethics Commission, who are more than happy to answer your questions and give you advice about um, Oregon Government Ethics Law. City Attorney's Office can do trainings, but you know we generally represent the city. Okay. One question. Yeah. Clarification of the fifty dollar gift. Uh huh. Okay. Is that one fifty dollar <laughs> gift a year, or is it multiples of fifty dollars? It's up to fifty dollars per source. So if somebody who has an interest in your policy decisions buys you a cup of coffee to the tune of $5 each week, that's going to add, if my math is right, that's going to add up <laughs> to more um, than $50 over the course of the year. So 
you know, one person can take you out for a, or, you know, give you a gift for $10, that same person can't la later give you a gift for, for $40, because that would add up. Okay, but I could have 100 people buy me a dinner. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what? We'll leave that up to you in the Oregon Ethics Commission. Um, I would generally, you know, there's the law and then there's public perception. I told Jackie 15 minutes. I feel pretty wow. good yeah. about, uh, about this presentation. Any specific questions any of you had regarding ethics for this budgetary uh, good? Okay. And we can also ask Ashley out throughout the process if we need to. So thank you very much. Enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. Okay. Kathy. Nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Kathy's been working very hard on our next biennial budget. Does everybody have a copy of this in front of you? We've got the slides. There's 39 slides in this presentation. Um, many of them are very self-explanatory, so I won't dwell on a lot of them. Um, and I think you. Fortunately, much of this information that I'm sharing with you tonight is not your responsibility. You'll just be reviewing it all in the end product. So don't please don't get overwhelmed for any of you who haven't been through this process before. So basically, what is local budget law? It's establishing our procedures, defining the programs, the fiscal policies. Let me uh, press the button. There we go. Um, encouraging the citizen participation, which as you all know is very important in this, requiring the estimates of resources and expenditures and controlling the expenditures of public dollars. We live and die under ORS 294-316 and that um, basically has all of the rules and regs that apply to local budget. It's a financial plan for specific period. And for it can be for one fiscal period or a biennium, which is what we're doing now. This will be the second biennium of the city. And uh, as always, fiscal years begin on July 1, end on June 30th, and will be spanning the two years. Be based on estimates of revenues and expenditures. The budget includes lawful appropriations, which, which gives us the authority then to spend the public money. Four-phase process proposing the budget, approving, adopting, and then how to live within the budget and what can be changed after it has been adopted. The next slide, which I always forget to press these darn things. Okay. The next slide is the budget calendar and that lays out in very small print what you're going to be doing over the next few months as f um, with the budget committee and then moving on to the city council adoption of it. The first phase of that is the proposed budget itself. The budget is prepared by fund. As you know, in governmental accounting, we do do fund accounting here. So it, the resources and requirements must be balanced and budgeted per fund. The estimates of resources and requirements are made in good faith. Basically, it starts off with the um, uh, figuring, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but figuring the 18-19 ending and then rolling that forward. The fund types that we have here are the general fund, which is our main operating fund. Special revenue funds, we have the urban renewal, which is separate from the um, city when it comes to budgeting. The road and street fund, police and communications levy, and the fire and emergency services levy. Those are all considered special revenue because the revenues are restricted for specific purposes. The debt service funds, which we have none at this current time. The debt that we've issued in URA stays in URA. The general fund debt is full phase and credit that will reside within the general fund. And then there is one water debt that is in the water revenue fund. So you will not see a separate debt service fund there. The capital project funds, we've got the library capital fund that was basically budgeted for but not used at all, so I will be uh, including a resolution to close that fund with this budget process. The Civic Buildings Capital Fund, of course, is building the new City Hall and Police Station. 
Our enterprise funds are the sewer, water, and storm, meaning they're business type funds and uh, uh, are accounted for in a little bit different fashion than general and special revenue funds. And then we have the one agency fund, which, which is the municipal court fund. And Oregon budget law a couple years ago came out with the requirement that you budget, even though we take in all the money and it's dispersed back out to various agencies for court fines and forfeitures, we have to budget that as a revenue and as an expenditure. So it basically inflates your books and that's about it. But it ends up at zero at the end of the year. Do you go and I keep, as I say? Maybe do you want a question, Tammy? Oh, it's right. <laughs> Sometimes the clicker doesn't work yeah, either. I, that's why I always give handouts because I've known that about myself. Um, on the standardized format that you'll see, you'll see uh, we have to show two years of actual. It'll be 15, 16, 16, 17. Then the present will be the current biennium of uh, 2017 to 2019. And then we will have show the um, two fiscal years individually, it doesn't show it on this diagram here, but with the proposed, we'll have the 1920 individually, the 2021 individually, and then a total column on that. Um, the, um, it will be a little bit confusing to do comparisons this year, because you've got the, the new biennium, the previous biennium, and then two separate years. So you'll have to do a little bit um, uh, computation sometimes if you're trying to look at a true comparison of them. Um, the preparation of the budget, which we're in the process of doing, well, just about finished up with right now, projecting the beginning balance for each fund. There is a lot of work that went into that for the 1819 as far as discussions with the directors and um, big, making sure that we are coming up with as close to an accurate ending fund balance as we could to start into the new biennium. We project the revenues, the transfers, the expenditures come down to your ending fund balance then. The beginning fund balance is, uh, as I say, the projected ending fund balance of 1819, so net amount of the revenues and expenses plus what was the beginning fund balance. Estimating the total revenues and expenditures for about seven months <coughs> before the end of the fiscal year. So this is what makes it tricky because we're not even halfway through the fiscal year and we're trying to predict where we're going to come out at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, the starting balance of working cash for 1920. With biennium budgeting, we have to take the um, ending of 1920 and then follow that cash through revenues and expenditures to come to the 2021 balance. The beginning balance will equal fiscal year 1920, the start of that, and the ending balance will equal fiscal year 2021. One of the issues that we ran into with this last biennium budgeting was that these fund balances were added and summed in total versus starting here and flowing through and ending here as they should have. So we'll be discussing that more during the, when we uh, go through the whole budget. So our revenues, our property taxes, which is a big one, needless to say, the franchise fees and right-of-ways, um, the interest earnings, grants, charges for services, the utility billing charges, et cetera, business license, the SDCs, those are all charges for services. We have our state taxes, which are the sin taxes, the liquor, ta uh, liquor um, cigarettes and marijuana, and then gas tax also too. Uh, court fines and forfeitures, which is, is staying very healthy, and then various miscellaneous um, revenues that come in. The types of taxes, this is getting in now to the um, tax category itself. We have the permanent rate revenue from our property taxes. We have the local option tax, similar to what we've got on um, uh, the police and fire levy, those are local options. And then the general obligation bonds where the voters agree to uh, support a, an issuance of debt that is financed by property taxes specifically. Do you have examples of that? Uh, yes, a school bond would be a, a GO debt. Um, 
Uh, you'll see them for parks bonds, for various things, things associated with water, sewer, storm. Those are most normally revenue bonds. So those would not have a property tax assessment with it. These are things that where the voters have agreed to say, I will pay 15 cents per thousand for this. It's cool. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, a big one there. Yeah. Here, it, most every school district period. Um, property taxes. So the county assessor annually verifies the tax rates and the levy submitted by each of the taxing districts. Uh, they and of course you're all familiar with the measure 50 etc as far as how that all works we are subject to a 3% increase um, in our assessed value every year that we calculate then our property taxes off of the only time you're going to see more than 3% of course is if you have a lot of new construction and or expansion of your property your boundaries and you're pulling in more um, uh, assess value that way um, and sometimes even during the recession we actually were getting less than many cities were getting less than 3% because of the, the um, uh, devaluation of housing it was it was getting pretty scary there for a while um, in estimating the tax it's limited to five dollars per thousand for education and ten dollars for general government that is based on real market value. So, of course, if you have more taxes out there than fits into this $15, then it, it hits into compression. <coughs> and they start uh, chipping away at the various um, entities that are, are um, levying the taxes. So, Kathy, can, we be, can you go over this a little bit with us so we can be clear about the compression on the top end of this? So, so you're saying... Five on the education and ten on the general government. Yes, and I, yes, that's the maximum. Now, as far as if the city is in, of Gladstone is in compression, I am not sure. I will check into that. I've not been advised of anything. There's and what I looked at a, a, a year or so ago, there was none. There's a re the reason is there is a lot of assumption about how mm -hmm. compression works in this region, and and with the measure five tax compression and the calculation, and it would be good for us to have. A, a, w a really good clear talking point about whether or not it affects Absolutely. us or whether or not we've got folks who are Yes, and I can get that information e easily from the county. Okay. So no Thank problem. Um, uh, one thing fortunate about compression is once the property value started going mm -hmm. back up, that it helped it the it situation a lot. R right. Yes, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so going on then to the budget requirements, um, as far as all of our expenditures, known as the requirements, the expenditures are the payroll related, materials and supplies or services, capital outlay, and debt service. And then we also have the transfers out, the operating contingency, unappropriated ending fund balance, and reserve for future expenditures. The unappropriated ending fund balance, you will not see that used in a, for uh, the projected, or excuse me, the proposed budget. That is only reflective of closed years. It's not going to be showing for our future years. Um, between that and the reserve for future expenditures, but especially with the unappropriated ending fund balance, unless there is a declared emergency within the city, it's very difficult to access those funds if necessary. So we try to, we pretty well stay away from that unless the council has decided that there is a definite reservation or uh, um, reserve of cash that you want to do for the future. You know. So it's, it, uh, I can provide further explanation on fund. that. Well, a rainy day fund is normally your contingency. That is a rainy day fund because even with the operating contingency, as you know, we've gone through a couple um, situations with this already. Yeah. It still requires council mm -hmm. approval in order to use any of the contingency. Um, but with the ending fund balance, it would have to be almost like a declaration of a, an emergency, a state of emergency within the city. So it's a, it's a far stronger or stricter requirement to be able to utilize but any of that. To take from the reserve for future. No, Unappropriated and reserved for future polls. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
So the big thing also too with of course uh, the budget process is the public interaction and hopefully participation in the budget process overall. So we publish the notice of the budget committee meetings uh, either two times in the paper or if you can imagine mailing first class to each street address or hand delivery to each street address. Um, the other thing that they have allowed us to do now is uh, one printing in the newspaper and then posting on the city's website. There are strict time requirements as far as when that has to be done. So we have to be sure and, and, <coughs> and address all of those as, as it goes on. Publication is not less than five nor more than 30 days prior to the meeting. And is it in the um, the letter that the newsletter that goes out to us as well, the city? Yes, that's not a neighbors. legal publication. I that's just a notification. That, but it still is in there. Yes, okay. yes, yeah, absolutely. We have to put it in the legal publication though, which of course is the. Mm -hmm. Review. We be amazed at the number of people yeah. that or come. The so as we go on to the phase two of the budget committee now consists as you know we have you all or almost all of you here it's the governing body the city council plus an equal number of appointed electors uh, cannot be employees agents or officers of the city and you will serve for staggered four-year terms and all members have the same authority within the budget committee Next, uh, bless you. Um, this week, the budget committee will be receiving the budget document. Uh, technically, we do not have to produce the budget document until the day of the meeting, but we will. We have committed to get it out to you by Wednesday of this week, and uh, you will hear the budget message at that time from the city administrator, and then we will hear and consider any public comment at the meeting and discuss and revise the budget as needed. Uh, approve the budget possibly in one meeting. Of course, we have a second one scheduled in case that is necessary, but it will be up to the budget committee to approve the budget and approve the property taxes. All meetings of the budget committee are open to the public uh, and you must allow the public comments at one or more meetings. And it is a public uh, document, of course, when released to the committee. A quorum is required, hear testimony, take action, and it's a majority of all committee members. So at your first meeting, you'll elect a chair and a vice chair. You'll receive the budget, hear the message, as I was just saying, and continue on with public comment and discussion of the, the actual budget itself. Um, determine the taxes as far as uh, also too is the entire permanent rate needed for operations. There are some cities that do not levy their entire permanent rate. City of Beaverton is one of them. So they're able to manage everything without doing that. Um, that's very unusual. I was going to say, that's odd. Yeah. That's very unusual. Um, so we will be levying the entire rate, just in case. And um, let's see. Also, too, as far as the amount of rate of local option, you can do that also, too, but as if there is a determination on that, but again, it will be utilized in full. So once we have gone to uh, full discussion and the budget committee is comfortable with it, the majority of the committee must approve the motion to approve the budget. And the budget um, and then once it's approved, your work is complete until the next budget cycle and the, uh, it will go on then to the City Council for adoption. Published summary. Then we, have, we make the long publication in the paper detailing the entire budget and again that has been allowed to be um, moved to just a single publication in the paper and publication on the website too. And again it's not less than five nor more than 30 days before the hearing. The LB1 and the UR1 forms, these are all furnished by um, the Department of Revenue. We follow the, you know, all of the prescribed forms that need to be done at that time. At the council meeting, when they do uh, go to adopt the budget, they'll have the budget hearings, 
hear any more testimony from any interested party at that meeting also too. Can we speak at that meeting? As a budget committee member? Yes. At the city council meeting? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And um, I've never had anyone come and speak from the budget committee at the city council meeting, so that's why I was unsure, so good yes, to know. That's <laughs> right. Um, <coughs> so you will commit, uh, as I say, consider all the work, the public comments, et cetera. Adjust the budget estimate or proposed taxes if you feel it's necessary. And you may increase expenditures, the city council may, but there are requirements on that. And if uh, if it's more than 10% or 5,000, whichever is greater, or if the rate or amount of tax increases by any amount, then they say you had levied at a not 100% rate and you decided to bump it up, then you would have to republish the budget and hold another public hearing on it. After the budget hearing and before July 1, we will need to enact all those resolutions and ordinances to adopt the budget, make the appropriations, impose the tax, and categorize the tax. Once it's adopted, then we file all the forms with the state and the county and uh, have everything in place by September 30th with the county to um, ensure that we have a tax base for the next year changes after adoption, that is uh, with the appropriations basically, the authority to spend money. And as it says, no greater expenditure or encumbrance of public money shall be made for any purpose other than the amount appropriated except that public bodies may make changes authorized or allowed by law, uh, exceptions that are authorized by statute, the supplemental budgets as we've gone through before that are allowed by statute, and then there are some special special cases described in statute too. Those are usually natural <coughs> disasters or some type of you know emergency situations that have happened. Um, the, some of the exceptions as to when you can increase your budget are specific purpose grants. They always encourage you to adopt a resolution and do that before spending any of the monies on anything. Uh, funded unforeseen occurrence or services that can happen. Um, and again, you must adopt a resolution before, before spending. If there was some type of unfunded mandate that was put through by the county and it affected us in the second year, and of course we're on a biennium budget, that would be a, you know, something that was not anticipated. It was an unforeseen circumstance. You can transfer appropriations between funds or within a fund after budget's been approved during the fiscal year. Uh, again, there are some uh, requirements. You must pass your resolution, state the need for the transfer, purpose of the expenditure, and the amount of the transfer. And that, of course, is just a net zero effect on the budget. Contingencies, those are always a tricky one because you do have to um, apply some percentages as far as what is allowed as a budget resolution versus a supplemental budget adjustment. And um, uh, with general fund to another fund, you can, you again, need a resolution. You can include resources and appropriation authority there. No resolution can transfer from any other fund without a supplemental budget. So if you wanted to take something out of the water fund to put to the street fund, we would have to have a supplemental where you don't have to do that necessarily on a general fund going to the street fund. But you don't call us back for that? No, not the, the, bu budget, the budget committee. All of this right. okay. at this point is in front right. of the city council okay. then, yes. And any pass-through adjustment. Pass-through adjustments. Um, uh, are one of the exception also to that you can do by a resolution usually versus a supplemental. So then it gets into the supplementals and where those are um, um, allowed. I don't know if you want me to go through whole, this whole list of what the what the allowed supplemental budgets are. Basically, again, it's um, things that are unforeseen, unknown, unplanned. They, the 
Department of Revenue strongly recommends that you put enough thought into your budget that you don't have these types of circumstances come up. But especially in a biennial situation where you're forecasting so far ahead, it's very common to have these types of things come up at least once a year. And of course, if you get new money. Like then, an annexation. Like an annexation, absolutely. Or if you get a, uh, for some reason, the property taxes came in way higher than forecasted and you wanted to utilize that money, then you can do that through a supplemental also. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Be a very peaceful community. <laughs> yes. Um, and it, here again is what I was talking about as far as one of these where you cannot transfer funds from the unappropriated ending fund balance except as provided by law. And that uh, doesn't go into what the law is here, but again, it, there are very strict requirements on that. Needless to say, before we make any type of supplement budget resolution transfer or a supplemental budget, bring it to the council. It's been thoroughly vetted through as far as that it's being handled properly and it's refer reviewed by the attorneys, et cetera. So the supplemental budget process, if fund expenditures differ less than 10%, then we do a public, no, uh, public notice that must include the detail of it and we can adopt the change within regular governing body meeting. If it uh, increases expenditures by more than 10%, then it must have the public notice with the publication and a public hearing required before adoption. So this line item expenditure no, in no. general is well, aggregate. It's, it's depending on how the budget was adopted. We'll be adopting the general fund by department, and we'll be adopting the other funds by operating expenditures, and then your um, uh, transfers in, in and out, your um, um, contingency, and your. Um, I'm sorry, I am a, a, everything other than operating expenditures are adopted separately. And uh, as long as it's within those appropriation levels, then it, it satisfies the requirements. But no, we don't go down to a line item or we would not be able to function. Want it. Okay. That was, you know, what we went through um, at the, at in probably January, February of last year, as far as um, realigning the budget so that it was actually functional. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, the budget presence is phenomenal. It's, it's succinct, it's simple, it's clear. And Kathy's done all that. She's brought that to Gladstone. I think you're going to see a whole new document this time about how easy it is to understand the department's expenditures and understanding what is in, in their project line items. So she's done a phenomenal job on that part for Gladstone. Thank you. And this year we're going to have a better idea of what the budget actually looks like by department because I think last time it was pretty much wild ass guesses a lot of the time. Yes, we've spent a lot of time uh, not only as I say getting an 1819 ending balance that was accurate to start out the year with, the biennium with, but um, a lot of time as far as actually you know, putting the budget together, determining what are feasible and reasonable line item expenditures to be in there. And then as they say, it will be adopted by the budget, by, by um, uh, department, so that the directors have the ability to manage properly and they can manage their budgets properly. Yes. So that was probably the fastest I've ever read through slides. On this <laughs> calendar here, um, please note that when the city council adopted it, we put the wrong date. It's April 23rd and not April 25th. April 25th is the night that we're hosting the Clackamas City Dinner at the high school. And so I just wanted to make sure you guys knew the 23rd would be the proposed date for that. Is the back on page 15 it says mm -hmm. uh, you've got some dates on here. What is the date that the the state puts you on the slap your hand list if you don't have it all together. 
you just don't miss it. <laughs> you just Many don't miss it. Have. Well, the reason is is because the county assessor has to have all of the information to get onto the county tax rolls. If you mit, if you did not get filed by September 30th with the assessor, then it will not hit the tax rolls. And seriously, the city could not get you know okay. you know unless the county uh, gave you some type of leeway on it. It would. It, I, you just don't miss it. Yeah. Our proposed date is June 11th for the city council to okay. adopt it. To yeah. adopt. So, yes. so June the 30th is. Excuse me, uh, Councilman Tracy. June 30th is the date it has to be adopted by internally here at the city. Got it. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. We're not making a calendar correction, correct? We've got April 23rd as the date, yeah? Right, we, but the one that went to council oh. said the 25th. Okay. This is the correct date here. Okay, thank I you. I just wanted you to know that. Any other questions? I know it was very fast, but I know most of you have been through this, so. I, I have a question. So uh, uh, I'm just trying to figure out who, who's everybody. Uh, yourself and the person sitting next to you are not budget committee members, is that correct? Correct, we're staff. Okay. Yeah. And then that person back there is not either. She's okay. staff. So the okay. ones that aren't here that are citizen members are Christy Haller Schaefer, Johnny Akers, and Brenda Schellingberg. Okay. And there's one more, Colette Umbras. So there is four name tags back there they are just all not here so we do have an equal number of council elected to citizens if they're not here they, they should have been here or they're just not here they don't have to come to orientation okay. all right but but and they don't have to come to budget committee either but that's why they were appointed and we're so going to we'll proceed with, with, with them, them or without them yes okay and you will also have department heads here at your budget committee meeting, so they can answer questions that you have on specific departments. And what will be the procedure for us to get those budgets on Wednesday? On Wednesday, they'll be sent to you uh, electronically, and okay. then also we'll be preparing binders for you too. Okay. It will probably be later in the day. Um, a Thursday, so they could be picked up. Yes. Okay. okay. Out and across from the water office. Yes. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. If there's not any more questions, then we can go ahead and adjourn our work session, our orientation. We'll adjourn at 6.18 p.m.